Have you ever heard the saying, you cannot step into the same river twice? How about, you cannot drive on the same road twice? Or, you cannot enter the same breast milk selling in twice? This phrase, used simply to describe the ever-changing world around us, lands itself a surreal expression within the Kashi Mike's 2003 film, Gozu. In this film, a Yakuza member by the name of Minami is tasked by the clan boss with assassinating Ozaki, his own brother by oath, who has been deemed a liability due to his growing insanity. The reluctant Minami only accomplishes his mission incidentally, as he seems to accidentally kill Ozaki in one of his deranged episodes. Shocked and guilt-ridden, the environment begins to change around him, as he rushes over to a local cafe to try and call in the successful hit, only to end up bewildered by the occupants and their version of hospitality. Even worse, Ozaki's body goes missing. While this may seem like a simple plot synopsis, this is actually as far as the literal story goes before descending into what can only be described as wandering insanity. Truthfully, it turns into this as soon as Ozaki is supposedly killed. Here, Minami looks back on the road that they were previously driving on, only to be greeted by a lick. The split at this very moment unveils its intentions, as Minami's remorseful wanderings throughout the movie turn into unusual, even malevolent encounters. But this isn't going to be some ostentatious rambling about how this abstract, somewhat obscure film actually holds some deep and grandiose theme intentionally baked into every scene that everyone else just missed, because it doesn't. This does not mean that there isn't a theme to the film either, just that the jumbled and confusing nature of each scene is the point of the movie. Mike in an interview compares it to how a child sees the world visiting places he has never seen before, and explains how it was even filmed in this way. Sato, the scriptwriter, was given total freedom and told to vent his frustrations into the scripts, while they filmed based on sudden images conjured up in the creation process, venturing into locations across Nagoya even they had not been to before. People often speak of the role of dreams in surrealism and films that aim to replicate such a feeling. And this unconscious and raw Gonzo-esque filmmaking is exactly the way in which this can be created. In fact, it is in the only dream sequence in this film that we meet the titular Gozu, a cow-headed humanoid creature of Buddhist origin. The deliberate usage of this deity is touched upon by Mike as well, in that people in Japan generally know the word Gozu, but not the meaning. In the same way, they may often practice the manners of Buddhism, but not understand the intent behind it. This act defines the theme of Gozu. We know the reason Minami travels around Vo, to find Ozaki, but what is the intent? Originally, he was tasked with killing Ozaki, but he never actually wanted to carry out this order, and only seemed to perform it by accident. So, finding Ozaki becomes just as confused as his attempted hit. Mike describes Minami as someone who is pure, and that a man such as him doesn't exist in the Yakuza. This fervor feeds into the childlike wonder that Mike pinned to the scene regression, as Minami is closer to a lost child than a Yakuza member on a mission, so he treads to wars where he can find Ozaki without really knowing his intentions. He continues his journey passively, obediently, and every step forward only serves to further accentuate his own confusion. Seemingly disparate men knowing each other in suddenly shifting relations. A licentious woman of multiple identities. A medium. His milk-producing hotel proprietress. And the Gozu Tenno of his dreams. This appearance of the Gozu is markedly distinct, as the hotel he comes to inhabit already seems like the entrance to hell. So, what of Gozu, the mythological doorman of the underworld? I have seen many people attempt to view this film in a sexual angle, and considering much of the sexual imagery contained within it, I can certainly understand why. 
However, I don't believe that this is an accurate view. Even in an interview where Mike is asked on the sexual content of the film and its thematic relation, he begins speaking of the detail of Minami's purity as I mentioned prior. Instead, I believe the sexual imagery is a mix of spontaneous creation and to highlight Minami's role confusion, which is also expressed sexually, rather than the inverse where the imagery is all an expression of his sexuality. For example, the constant appearance of breast milk is both a curiously distasteful detail, yet one that also accents Minami's child status in a very simple way. Just like children in new unknown locations, Minami is marked by his meekness, feeling that he cannot influence the events transpiring before him, even if he may really want to. Much of his activities lie in waiting, asking questions and observing what lies in front of him. The film only reaches a climax as soon as Minami finally decides to take action, and he does so in an expressly sexual context. Once again, it is the sexual that becomes the vehicle for the themes of Minami's plights, not the other way around. The themes and visual representation they find themselves embedded are quintessentially straightforward. Minami's personal dilemma even seems common, so common that it may characterize childhood or youthfulness itself. Yet exactly because it is so elementary, we get perhaps one of the funniest and most succinct endings to a movie perhaps ever. Not only in its raw imagery like most of the film possesses, but in how it functions more as a sudden punchline to a joke that you should have seen coming earlier, but didn't. Much like Dreams, this movie is actually quite simple, but hard to take in at first. Minami's lesson is clear, yet like most life lessons we come to learn, it can simply be difficult to integrate into our current mindset, and even more challenging to wrap one's head around the benefit of doing so to begin with. This is, in most cases, not a movie that is teaching its viewers something, but one made and written by men who vented their immediate frustrations out into film, and through the process, learn to laugh at themselves. And after some time, I began to laugh too. Thank you for watching.